Ho, 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 do we have plenty to discuss. And I'm going to do my best to stay as level-headed and grounded as possible, mainly just because my anxiety was a little spiky earlier today prior to the game. But this was a whirlwind of a ball game that we have to get into. A true eighth inning Metsian collapse in the most Mets way possible. How you doing, everybody? It's your boy, Wardy, and we're back at it with the ladies' post-game segment. I got a lot to say as the Metropolitans, who looked like they had a clear win in their possession, dropped it, choked it, fumbled it, the best way possible the worst way possible for us fans the best way possible for the Cincinnati Reds as the Mets falter in game two of a three game set by a final score of nine to six in today's show we're going to go over again where were the key takeaways from this ball game because there was a lot of good by the Mets in this one and there was also plenty bad a Mets team that's supposed to be built with strong defense and pitching only had strong pitching for a quarter of the game I mean right around halfway point of the game today then we had bullpen struggles like no tomorrow pitch poor decision making defense masterclass my absolute you know what the quite opposite defensive miscues left and right throughout this entire ball game mental errors physical errors all went against the Mets and that is exactly why they dropped this one in a truly horrendous fashion. Everyone first chiming in live on YouTube. Happy to have you all in here. Make sure to smash that like and subscribe on greatly appreciate. We're less than 100 subs away from our next short term goal of 25k in which we'll be doing a big channel giveaway. So make sure you chime in there and also to all my Twitter viewers make sure to hit that like follow button retweet and know that I will only be interacting with the live chat on YouTube today as I usually do. So so to everyone first chime in and really appreciate you all. Like I said, we have a lot to get into. I see Daniel, great member, Oil, Priest, Lane, Daniel Cass Cassiano, Allen, Frank, Mart going down the list. My man, Jay Serrano. Let's see. Buzz Talk, E, James, great member, PB, great member. Let's vent. Exactly. Yeah, we have a lot to get into in this one, everybody. My apologies in advance if this is not the best video quality. Everything else should be good, though, graphics-wise. Highlights, I'm just showing one of the few bright spots, ultimately, from this game, which was Lee Severino for the most part. As you see from a couple nice Ks there they had today. I did not go out of my way to get all the highlights, you know, figured out because, one, on the road right now, and two, the fact that the Mets lost the game the way that they did today, no. Miss me with the nonsense that I'm going to go ahead and cut up the Reds single-handedly murdering the Mets in the eighth in the most Mets way possible. When I tell you that was the most ridiculous inning I've seen, and that's up there, folks. Us Mets fans have seen the absolute worst innings imaginable. Even just over the past five-plus years, we have seen true shit show par my French performances that once again that once again was a true masterclass on that run I'm being horrendous defensively because from the Mickey Mouse hits to the ridiculous mental errors leading to physical errors that we would see to everything in between it was just a true cultivation of a Mets team that looked like they had something and just completely let it go away they acted like they didn't know how to play baseball anymore it was horrendous so again this is a safe space this is a vent area for many of you Mets fans first chiming in people that watch on replay the same applies down below in the comments. Let me know your biggest takeaway for sure. My quality is better than the, the quality of the Mets. I appreciate that. Certainly, that's a low bar too there for sure. And again, I see a lot of awesome people in here. We're going to get things started here shortly. Michael Stroh, that was an emotional roller coaster. It absolutely was. It absolutely was. And we have a lot to get into. Look, I got the notes for you. Hopefully, I can read them all off in time without being too long. When did today? Shout out to my amazing sponsor, as always, at BetUS, who has you covered with all your sports betting needs, but a little bit more on them later on in the show. I did have the Mets run line today. Mets ended up losing 9-6. to So the Mets needed to either win or make sure that they didn't lose by a certain amount of runs. So made sure that they didn't lose by more than one and a half. They unfortunately did that today. And that's why if you hammered Reds money line or Reds run line today, you were in the win column because they won by at least three runs. Very frustrating. Got to say, that's what I get. That is what I get for deciding to put the, the Mets in my three pick parlay today. I'm not allowed to have nice things this early into the season. That's the unfortunate thing. How's the best shortstop in the National League? Yes, he played like dog shit today. We'll get into that. Trust me. Trust me, guys. I'm all 
all in favor of doing the ovation like Steve Cohen said when he's back because again the best way to try to turn a player around is to help uplift him surprise surprise you booing a player every single night is not going to help out their mental in any which way shape or form I promise you that the players say it themselves Trey Turner Alec Bohm are great examples of thriving when the fans were initially against them and then turning for them and then they would take advantage of that rally afterwards so we'll get into all that but yes Francisco Lindor was absolutely a net negative for the Mets once again today going over five had some bad luck he had 104.5 mile per hour dead center a uh, rip on like a first pitch but what's frustrating to me is between a between Lindor, between Alonzo, what we saw in today's game was a continuation of just a lack of a true hitter's approach. Why are we first pitch swinging with multiple guys on? That goes for you too, Pete. Why are we doing this? Like, when did we ever think that this was the right thing to do, that it makes sense, that we shouldn't be grinding out at bats when we have guys on base? The fact that Omar Narvaez was the Mets' saving grace offensively today is hilarious. That just shows you how Mets scene of a game this was because the same man that never provides offense also provide piss-poor defense, which went in hand with the unraveling unravelry of a true shit show eighth inning that we're about to break down together when i tell you that eighth inning and you guys and gals that watch this know this too it was absolutely ridiculous going through it but i don't want to waste too much time dilly dallying i want to get right into this one breaking down the ball game i want to see your reactions as well criticism is warranted frustration is warranted as the mets are now two and six for their first eight games of the season they had they really felt like they had a serious victory in their grasp and we're only going to be two games below 500 Luis severino gets what you want from him today just goes an inning shy of what you were hoping for in six he goes five and that ended up nipping the mets in the butt bigger ways than you could possibly imagine with their bullpen usage as we would get into Johan Ramirez and all those types of things. But holy guacamole, I really want to be more aggravated than what I currently am right now. I'm trying to stay fairly even keeled. I know that this was a ridiculous game today. Let's talk about it. To everyone again for chiming in live on YouTube, thank you all so much. Continue to smash those buttons. People on Twitter, same applies. Let me make sure that that is up and running without a problem. I usually like to put under the Mets Twitter too when I'm going live as well because I know there's a bunch of people that see their Twitter posts. So get me one second, everybody. I'm going to go ahead, go ahead and do that. All right, folks, question for you. Out of all the losses the Mets have had this season, where do you rank this loss? Is this the worst loss the Mets have had considering they had a win fairly in their possession and blew it in the worst way possible? Or is it the lifeless losses that they've had this year against the Brewers, for example, where they just had no offense to show and the, some games against the, uh, against the Tigers, same applies. Let me know, everybody watching live, people on replay, where do you rank this Mets loss out of the losses that we've had so far this season? Because yeah, it's up there. It absolutely is for sure. But now let's break down the ball game, everybody. So, just a little quick update. J.D. Martinez, if there's any positive to take away from baseball today, it is J.D. Martinez did have himself a single in his rehab game as he's playing as we speak right now. So, the man cannot come to the Mets soon enough. Offense wasn't the entire issue for the Mets today. It was far more on the bullpen decisions, the horrendous defensive miscues leading to their errors and everything in between. Another suspect day managing by Carlos Mendoza. I didn't hate Mendy's decisions today, but... But as we get into the eighth inning, I think there's rightful criticism because you could have utilized someone else there. And that other person, I would still take every day of the week, stretched out, potentially going for six outs, than Johan Ramirez and what he did there in the eighth. But now let's get into it. I don't want to, again, drag this any longer. I know we got a bunch of people, roughly 400 live viewers. Happy to have you all in here watching on YouTube, at least Twitter. Same applies. Appreciate you all. And the first thing today, again, Nick Martinez versus Luis Severino. What did I say my pregame show today? I want Want Sevy to, to go five or six innings, two to three earn run ball. Just keep the Mets in the ball game. Sevy did his job today for the most part. Just again, that one inning falling short ended up hurting the Mets more because they didn't have a lot of arms to utilize in their pen, unfortunately, today, at least comfortably without th pitching him for a second or third consecutive day. But as we start there in the first, Mets bats 
up three, down three. Brandon Nimmo back, DHing there, missed one game with a hamstring injury, looked abso absolutely horrendous in his first at bat of the day. He would make up for it later on in the game. Brandon would have a good day at the play, all things considered, but a bad first at bat for him. The Mets go down in order between Nimmo, Lindor, and Alonzo, and it's a one, two, three quick work for Nick Martinez, the new right hander there in Cincinnati, coming from the San Diego Padres this past offseason. And the bomb, the first, Luis Severino looking sharp with a one, two, three a strikeout on a 97 mile per hour splitter as well which looks so sharp I give a lot I have to give a lot of credit where credit's due today Luis Severino again did not have a good defense behind him today worked some unfortunate jams because of walks but Sevy stuff was awesome and when I say awesome the velo was there too big time Luis Severino today 82 out of the 99 pitches he threw or 93 miles per hour or faster that's fantastic I mean he was comfortably setting 97 up until he was out of the game there so a lot of good improvements that we saw from Luis Severino today that I will share more briefly as we break down more of the ball game Dave thank you so much for a two dollar donation Dave with the clown emojis the shit emojis and the laughing emojis sounds about right I appreciate that I'm already broken this season was over at the trade deadline last year Priest is already done with the season there you go okay Severino, one of the few bright spots from today's game outside of not being able to go past the fifth inning or so. Regardless, Sevy would have one, two, three first that we would see everybody. In the second, Stolly Marte, another great game. Very happy with what I saw from Marte today. He got on base multiple times, stole multiple bags. Lots to like there from Starley Marte. Again, he gets on base with a single, a stolen base, and then Ellie De La Cruz with an error moves Marte to third base. Ellie is such a young, exciting player, but he, of course, still has miscues defensively and offensively still working on his game. He's only 22 years of age. He's going to be stunned. I have, I have a lot of confidence in him. Such a flashy 5 tool player. Love everything about him. Just don't like him when he's playing the Mets and if he's performing well against the Mets, at least. But still, Marte with a single and a stolen base. Mets couldn't convert there. As we get to the third they leave the runner stranded on third base as we get to the bomb the second rather Condelario with a double Ellie De La Cruz with an RBI fielder's choice because Jeff McNeil with a very simple play unfortunately completely botches it misses a ball on the grounder by Ellie that allows that to be an RBI unfortunately and just like that the Reds find themselves with a one nothing lead but this would be a unearned run as this would not be charged to Luis Severino, it shouldn't be at least because that was absolutely ridiculous what we saw Sevy having to go through there. I mean, just truly ridiculous. I hate the fact that this is a second straight start for Sevy within the first two innings. There's a clear mental error, clear physical infield error, and he has to work with that right away. Neil, yes, I know. I know Braves fans are going through it right now with Spencer Strider. I hope it's not season ending. Unfortunately, it looks that way given the fact that he has to, you know, issues with his UCL at the moment. I don't wish that for anybody. It doesn't matter how much I might hate the team or even despise the specific players. I don't wish injury on anyone. That absolutely sucks. Strider is great for the game of baseball. He makes the game better, not worse. And I really hope that he has a speedy recovery with what with whatever the status of his injury is going to be. Same thing can be said with Shane Bieber. Same thing can be said with Yuri Perez and everyone in between. Trevor Story we saw just get hurt. I mean, uh, I, Jonathan Laws, I'm going to butcher on the last name. Lil Isaka there um, from the Yankees just got hurt too. A lot of guys are getting hurt. It really is frustrating to say the least. But I digress. Let's get back into breaking down the ball game, everybody. And everyone first chiming in on YouTube. Appreciate you all being in here as we break down together what was a horrendous loss for the Mets and the manner in which they lost this ball game. But as we advance further in the setting, Spencer Steer with a single, Stevenson with a walk, and this is where things get frustrating. Okay, because two outs here for Luis Severino, right? He's trying to get out of his jam. He strikes out the eighth batter he sees, and Nick Martini, nice K there, cannot get the out on Tyler Stevenson. Stevenson gets the walk. Back to the top of the order, Jonathan India, who grew up a diehard Mets fan, continues to rake against us, the team he grew up loving. An RBI walk, Benson with a strikeout, then would end it. Huge strikeout there to limit the damage. Mets are down by two through the first two innings. As we get to the third, Omar Narvaez, folks. Omar Narvaez, um, appreciate the donation, Dave. I am not in favor of players being hurt, however, but I appreciate the donation a lot. Thank you so much, as always, my friend. Um, as we get to the third, though, Omar Narvaez, who would end up being a problem for the Mets before this game would conclude, starts things off offensively, gets himself a single. Brandon Nimmo gets himself a single. You want to know what the Mets do with that? 
with their key batters in Francisco Lindor and Pete Alonso? Absolutely nothing. Quick flyouts afterwards. Nothing to show for it. Leaves a couple runners stranded there. Beyond pissed off again. Why are we not grinding these at bats more, Frankie? Why are we not grinding out these at bats more, Alonso? It goes on both of you here. Drives me up a wall when we see that transpire. Mets are still down as we get to the bottom of the third. Luis Severino with a 1 2 3 inning, his second of the day. Two strikeouts, including a beautiful looking sweeper. Honestly, it looked a little bit more like his usual slider it was 89, but really, really sharp. He was throwing hard today. The splitty looked great. The four seam fastball looked solid, too. It had more, more whiffs on it. Definitely better than what we saw his first start around where he was so reliant on his heater because he didn't have his breaking pitches going. Today, he had his breaking pitches going. Took a little bit to see the sweeper, but once we did, it looked sharp. Lots of positive takeaways. Again, I have to say about what we've seen from Luis Severino today as a whole. As we then get to the fourth inning, Brett Beatty with a single because Brett's an absolute beauty. He's batting just under 300 now in the season, folks. Not too shabby for the young man at the hot corner. Marte with a walk. Jeff McNeil with a hit by pitch. Bases are loaded just like that for Omar Narvaez. And what does Omar Narvaez do with two outs? Two outs, folks. He actually produces with a two-run single, rips it to right. That brings in a couple runs. The Mets tie the ball game. Yes, you heard that correctly. Omar Narvaez provided offense for the Mets today. Uh, initially, I was like, there is a God. And then it was the baseball God's reality of what you get from Omar, he will also take away. And he would do that as we got on later in the eighth inning. But before we got there, things were looking great earlier on. Narvaez drives him two with two outs. And Brandon Nimmo, who struggled to swing the bat well at all so far this season, Picks it up too. Has himself a two-run double. Mets get themselves a 4-2 lead there through the fourth inning. And Luis Severino with another 1-2-3 inning there in the fourth with a strikeout, his second to final inning. And then as we get to the fifth, everybody, Stalin Marte with a single and a stolen base. You'll love to see that. He is driven in then by Tyrone Taylor with an RBI double, and the Mets increase their lead. They have a three-run lead, a little bit of a cushion here, 5-2, as we advance further then into the bottom of the fifth. Seve with a clean inning, two outs. He then gives up an unfortunate triple to Benson, but gets out of the jam unscathed. Luis Severino's final line, folks, is the following. You're going to get a solid five innings of three hit Two run, one earn run ball, two walks, seven strikeouts. Sevy worked not only his fastball beautifully today, the splitty looked great, got some solid swing to miss on that. The sweeper versus the normal slider, it was nice to see the differentiation. I liked a lot from what I saw from Luis Severino today. And the only thing that sucks is that Sevy couldn't go six. Because if Sevy goes six, the Mets more than likely win this ball game with how the pitching alignment would be afterwards. It's frustrating. It is what it is. Man, oh man, I just hope we can get a little bit more from Sevy next Next time, at least in instances where we know we have a short bullpen like we did today. And that is what hurt the Mets so much along with their piss poor defense. But Luis Severino, folks, let's give credit where credit's due. A much better outing than what we saw his first time out there. Giving up 12 hits to the Brewers because you don't have your breaking ball versus only giving up three in a batter's park like Cincy. Out dueling Nick Martinez, who I honestly thought Nick Martinez might have a better outing than, the, than Seve today because one, we didn't know what to expect from Severino. And two, we certainly didn't know what to necessarily expect from uh, the Mets offense, even in a batter's park. Again, they need to prove it to us. So Seve, one of the few bright spots, I would say, that came out of this game. And then as you see from Jake Diekman and Johan Ramirez, they tell the story right there, folks, because holy shit, do things get so much worse after that. Severino is done after five. In the sixth, after Narvaez had himself a single, his third hit of the day, Jake Diekman comes in. Ellie De La Cruz gets on with a walk. Spencer Steer with a hit by pitch, Fairchild with an RBI single, and then you see a double steal as Steer gets home, steals home. Yes, that happens. So Jake Diekman unfortunately has a Jake Diekman outing where he can't command the strike zone well, gives up hard contact, and just like that, it is a one-run ball game. Still in the Mets' favor, but not as favorable as it once was, as they're only a 5-4 then, Heading into the seventh inning. And in the seventh inning, the Mets get a quick one, two, three work from Johan Ramirez. Nice inning there for Johan, who again, it's his first outing back after being suspended for a couple games after he pitched in the three innings against the Brewers not long ago. Or, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was the Brewers, right? Not the Tigers. Whatever it was. Regardless, though, Ramirez is back. He has himself a nice first inning. We're loving that. And then we get on to the eighth inning. 
And this is where things become a problem because Jake Diekman was a start of the unraveling in this game. hundred percent also was the piss poor defense that we saw what felt like throughout the entirety of this ball game, almost every inning, but it's Johan Ramirez folks in the eighth inning. Carlos Mendoza said today he had three pitchers available that he could utilize today. And it was Johan Ramirez, Jake Diekman and Jorge Lopez. Two of those three pitchers were used. Johan Ramirez gets worked early in the eighth inning no warm-up, nothing. If Johan Ramirez is not pitching the eighth inning or is pulled after at least seeing the first two batters he faces, this might be a completely different ball game. But it's not. So instead of going for a more veteran option, a guy who's pitched in multiple innings in his career before, even if it hasn't been a heavy amount, and Jorge Lopez... So instead of taking that potential risk, uh, bringing in Lopez and then maybe needing him again for the ninth, we're going to stick with an inexperienced Johan Ramirez, who clearly was not the same pitcher that we saw in the seventh and unfortunately unraveled just as bad as we saw Luis Severino unravel to an extent in his first start against the Brewers. What I mean by that is the following, folks. Candelario with a walk and a stolen base. Of course, a pinch runner gets at him because there's a balk. Yes, a balk happens. Already there's a red flag. A runner's in scoring position just like that. This is where we have a problem, folks. Jake Fraley strikes out. Omar Narvaez cannot catch it afterwards. Goes past him. Runners on the corners. No outs without a problem. If you are Carlos Mendoza, how do you not even fathom the idea to at minimum start warming up the bullpen there? There was no bullpen warm-up from my understanding. The bullpen warm-up didn't start until well after the Mets were clearly in a position where it was going to be an uphill battle to win this game. And yeah, we're going to warm up Julio Tehran instead. Because that makes sense, right? I'm I'm so annoyed by the fact that you had Jorge Lopez there. You could have utilized him for potentially six outs or maybe bring in whoever you need to potentially get that final out or two. F it. Maybe even consider Julio Tehran for the final out or two and that do something different. But put yourself in a position where you still are in command and in control of this ball game. Not what you do in the eighth today and let Johan do his thing and he absolutely crumbles after the defensive miscue here by yes Omar Narvaez it was an absolute shit show from this point forward right there's a reason why he's still charged with the amount of runs that he's charged with and it starts with the following here you get the unfortunate runners on the corners with no outs right then everyone's safe because of it and then you see Ellie De La Cruz with an RBI on an infield chopper that was completely misread. Lindor, Beatty, they have no clue what to do. It just goes past both of them. It was a complete freeze. Everybody clap your effing hands is what it felt like in that situation. The red score there, I was, I was truly at a loss for words in that potential situation as I happened because... It's a tied ball game. Ellie De La Cruz just puts the ball in play. This is exactly how Phillies and Braves fans felt against the Mets in the first half of 2022. That was the most BS inning, breaking it down, how they managed to get their runs. But you know what the Reds did? They put the ball in play. They run hard in the bases, and they played scrappy. They did what they needed to do to ultimately win this ball game. You have to give credit where credit's due. Because you know what they do? After they still have bases loaded, no out, Spencer Steer, who absolutely roped one, off of uh, Quintana yesterday for a solo shot. Rips a freaking bomb today. Three-run home run. Sorry, I don't know why I said it was a bases juice. I'm pretty sure it was three-run home run. That increases the lead. Mets look like they're out of this one. It's an 8-5 Reds lead. The Reds don't stop there. Bases are clear. No outs. Johan Ramirez. Still not. No one's really warming up too much. They're like, all right. Fairchild with a single. We'll do that. Stevenson with a single. We'll do that. Jonathan India with a walk. Bases loaded, folks. No outs. You're already down 8-5. And now we see Julio Tehran start to get stretched out and warmed up in the pen. What are we doing here? What are we doing here is my initial reaction. So after that... Encarnacion strand with an RBI sack fly and then an error by Bader, which allows the runners to advance to second and third. Thankfully, no more runs would score after that. Then Brett Beatty has an RBI to drive in Alonzo in the ninth. And that's the effing ball game, folks. That's the ball game. If it wasn't for that eighth inning, the Mets may very well still win this one. My head scratching comes from Jorge Lopez not being involved in this ball game. I understood from Mendoza's side and point of view, he didn't have many arms to work with today. But what I don't understand is when you know a young and experienced pitcher is clearly rattled, no outs, runners on the corners, why are you not pouncing there? Why are you not? 
at that point pouncing to get Lopez warmed up as soon as humanly possible. Why not even prior to that? Why not after the first batter, potentially, that you see there in the eighth? Because, yes, while you have a three-run lead, look how quick that three-run lead in a batter's ballpark, one of the best in Major League Baseball there in Cincy, how quickly things can change and go against you. So that is where my biggest gripes are today. There were some offensive showings that I was happy about, and I think we can all agree. Brett Beatty looks solid again. Two for five with the RBI. I love that, Brett. Defense, for the most part, wasn't a problem outside of that fluke play with Ellie's chopper. I don't know who to really blame there. It's that situation. I kind of want to put some blame on Beatty, but there was just a complete defensive miscue. No, no one knew what the hell they were doing. Brandon Nimmo, two for four. Love to see that as we discuss. Francisco Lindor, 0 for five. Dog shit. Love Lindor. We need him to be better. It's terrible. The death threats and things I heard that his wife just posted on socials yesterday. That should never be happening. And yes, I'm in favor of giving him an ovation and get his spirits right the same way that we saw in Philly with Boehm, the same way that we saw with Trey Turner. Because here's the thing, everybody. I'll just say this. There are fair criticisms for Lindor right now, and I agree with you. But my question to you is this. What gain do you personally get out of booing your favorite team and your favorite players when you know that it won't positively impact things whatsoever i've spoken to active and retired players they will all tell you that booing more often than not does not help them whatsoever if anything it just impacts them mentally in a negative manner so why not try to rally and try to uplift a player that we know is our franchise shortstop that's one of the best shortstops in major league baseball when he is right and we know how good and talented he is when he is at his best why not try to uplift him and do something that has worked with other teams? And if it doesn't, then okay. Then if you want to go back to your booing ways, so be it. But at least you put forth that little bit of effort on your end to suggest that, hey, you know, I'm not the biggest schmuck of a fan. I at least have rooted instead of just booing. I'm going to be an optimist. And if the optimism doesn't work out after a while, then I'll become a pessimist. Right? That's what that's what frustrates me with fans. I got schmucks out here commenting on my Twitter saying, you know, we need a boo Lindor every single day until he's off the team. One, he's on a decade-long contract. He's not going anywhere anytime soon, regardless of if, what you want. It ain't going to happen. Secondly, for more reasons than one, Lindor isn't going anywhere from the contract standpoint and because of what he means to this team. Thirdly, you know how quick it'll be for all you fans to switch up and realize how much of a glaring hole we'd have if Lindor was gone? I mean, I feel like the the one time the Mets, we finally have players that are justified to root for, but as soon as things do not go in their direction, we have to have pitchforks and fire like no tomorrow. It's true, I have a Simpson scene. You know, it's almost like if we didn't have that type of reaction as immediate as we do, there would be a different fan perception, one. And secondly... Maybe the players would actually get uplifted if we just try to uplift them ourselves. So all I'm saying, I'm in favor of doing the ovation when they're back at City Field. Steve Cohen said it himself. He thinks it's a great idea. Just why not? You literally have nothing to lose, folks. If you want to be pessimistic and boo your top players all season long and not potentially help them in any which way, shape, or form, by all means, you do you boo. But I'm telling you, it's only going to make things worse for not only the player, but the team the team that you're following and watching and living and dying on a night-to-night basis. I'm just saying you're shooting yourself in the foot more than you really realize because you're letting your short-term emotion get in the way of the big picture and trying to hopefully still have a somewhat successful season and getting the best out of our, our certain players. So that is what I have to say. Trust me. Trust me when I say I understand Lindor's playing like shit right now. That is what I'm not disagreeing with, okay? And yes, I know some of you guys prefer to boo versus uplift. Everyone's teach your own. Make your own decisions. That's fine. I'm just telling you, do not be surprised that by your booze at City Field in his first at-bat before he even starts hitting, it's not going to have a positive impact on him. And if you care about the team, if you want the team to win, it's almost like you should do the little things that could potentially make a difference. That's what I'll leave you with on that front. Trust me, I get it. He's playing like shit. Imagine thinking Lindor is a top player. Imagine thinking Lindor isn't a top player. It's common sense. Six war player the past couple of years, 30 30, 30 home runs, 100 RBIs, one of the best gap to gap hitters when he's been right too. Like, I just, the notion that he's not a top player on this team, let alone not a top shortstop in the National League, is a hilarious notion that we're going to allow the first eight games of a regular season dictate what the track record has been. That is truly comical to me, and that's the difference between my mindset versus some of you. 
And again, that's fine. To each their own. Everyone's going to feel that the way that they want. Some people are going to say, Wardy, you're a schmuck. How dare you like Lindor? Shame on me for not turning on a player right away because I actually have confidence in them turning things around, unlike I have confidence in a good portion of players in this roster to do the exact same. And if Lindor goes all year and he's piss poor, then by all means, that's a different discussion. I'm going to find myself with you at the pitchfork front. Like, what the hell is going on? And that's where you really need to look at, should something be changed here? Should something be had? But I firmly believe we're not going to go all season with Francisco Lindor going one for 31 on the stretch he's currently at. Yes, the Mets suck right now. Can't deny that. You know, they do in a certain degree, right? We had a certain level of expectations this year. We knew how high. Well, you don't know how high the highs are going to be yet, but we do know how fairly low the lows are going to be. All these teams are running there. That's my bad, everybody. But as we continue to break down and go through the game together, I do want to let you all know about our amazing sponsor, BetUS. But before I do, before I do, I'm just really curious now because we had this Lindor discussion. And I'm more than happy to continue doing them, okay? My question to the viewers watching live on YouTube, the people that watch live on replay, rather, people that are watching live on Twitter, let me know in the comments. Spam them in the chat. Are you going to be cheering or booing Francisco Lindor next time you're at a Mets home game? If you're going to pick between the two, are you basically, are you in favor or against giving him an ovation at, at City Field when the Mets go back to City Field? That's my, I'm really curious. I want to see what the split is in the live show right now and for people on replay. Because I know we have a lot of Lindor supporters. I know we have a lot of Lindor haters that goes way back to prior to this season, really since the Mets acquired him and signed him because they didn't even like the fact that Lindor waited to the final hour to be extended, even though he never played a game in the organization. And let's not forget the Mets don't have a storied organization either, so there's a lack of appeal there. Um, let me know. Are you for or against? Let me hear it in the chat. And I'll actually put a uh, poll up right now too. Let me do that. Let me get a pull up for you all. And guys, we're halfway to 100 likes here in the live show. Thank you all so much. Continue to smash that like and subscribe on. Really does mean a lot. And thank you all so much in advance. Give me one second, everybody. Okay, we got the poll in the chat now. So you guys can answer through the, through the poll too. That'll be cool. I don't boo my team, period. I cheer every player, says PB. Against, but I won't boo him off rip. He comes up to uh, comes up to bat, and what he does dictates the response. He Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Boo loud and clear, says Alex. Fire Cohen. You can't fire the owner, you schmuck. Take a back seat. Um, cheer, rah, 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 boom, ba. Okay. <laughs> won't boo, but no way I'm giving him an ovation. Way overrated. Okay. Lindor is a career 270 hitter. It's more than bad average, my friend. I'm, oh, you already lost me there. Love you, though. Appreciate the support. Thank you. Um, fans don't realize that a player's mentality is real when they hear the boos. Yes, Brett Beatty went through that a lot last year. He publicly spoke on his mental struggles last year. And that's why us being as positive as we've been about him heading into the season, you're seeing it being received well, right? And that's awesome. And I hope that continues. 30-30 with a bone spur who had surgery this offseason. Let's also not forget that. I wonder if that goes at all in hand with his slow start. I can't imagine it has much of an impact, but yes, he went all last season with an irritated bone spur as he had his 30-30 home run, 30-30 uh, season. But again, I, digre I digress. Yes, Lindor is the most overrated player ever. Yes. I, I feel like there's a difference between overrated and just, you know, he's one of the best players on your team and you don't like that he's one of the best players on your team because you want more out of him from what from what you're getting and i think that is what warrants some of these reactions let's reward mediocrity yes because being our being arguably the best shortstop past couple of years is mediocre heard you mike love that um cheering 100 percent booing doesn't make sense you're a mets fan through the ups and downs it is more than bad and average i agree but look at his other stats i have trust me i have i have i uh let's see here but look at his other stats. Just look right now. He has gone down in every major stat for victory um, since every year in his career. Every major stat, I I will check. I, I'm not going to check that right now, but I will do my due diligence after the live show. So that way, next time that we talk, I can have a response for you. That's fine. I can gladly do that. I don't think it matters because the next uh, lot uh, because the next loss, I'll stick a fork in all of them. 
because they're not getting past Atlanta. I mean, I don't see the Mets getting past Atlanta either. The Mets can literally just muster a total of a split at absolute best in Atlanta. I will be very happy. Very happy. So, so far in the chat, out of, again, just under 100 votes, we got 65 in favor and 35 or so against regarding the status with Lindor and potentially doing a standing O or not. Um, I want him to earn it. Here's the thing, and I understand that. Lindor is never going to earn a $340 million. The only way he does is if the Mets win a World Series with him. Um, but when it comes to actual player value, and this is not Lindor's fault, this is a market value fault, no one is ever going to actually live up to those exact contracts. It's very slim. It's near impossible. I mean, just reality. That's what happens when you sign a guy to a decade plus when he's already you know, towards the tip of the top of his peak prime versus him starting up, still in RBRs and all those kind of things. And that doesn't just go for Lindor. I feel the exact same way about most players in Major League Baseball with their long-term contracts, if not all. They're, for the most part, all of them really aren't going to age properly. That's going to warrant their AEV, especially in the second halves of their contracts. But it's about can they help propel you to win a championship. If the Mets win one or multiple championships while Lindor is a Met and while being a key contributor, then that's where you could say that it was money well spent because he helped get us over the hump. Something that, again, to this point, we haven't had happen since 86. Let's see. Um, I always never understood booing. It's almost like Lindor and Javi were trying to send that message to fans in 2021. I'll be, it was a poor way. It was a poor way. I agree with that. But yes, that was in essence what they were doing because literally they're just more, they were more outspoken examples, especially Javi because Javi's more outspoken than Lindor. I'm just being straight up and like what bothers them, what doesn't. And again, if a player is bothered by fan reaction and they aren't able to kind of turn the tide, then at that point, while yes, you'd love the player to change, you can't give them too much shit if they don't have the best mentality. You know, in those circumstances, it's more so it's like, okay, is there anything that we can do to kind of help change things? Because let me put it this way, just for the fans that actually make things worse for a player, when we all want them to succeed and be better, those are the fans I truly don't understand and comprehend. Those are the ones that truly have me baffled because you just want negativity for your team and then you wonder why things continue to be stagnant and in a negative direction versus potentially a positive direction. When you underperform, you get booed. Yes, you do, my friend. But just because that happens doesn't mean you should be getting booed left and right, right? So, okay, so because Francisco Lindor the past couple years has overall put up very strong seasons for the Mets, but because he's off to a very piss poor start through the first week or so of the season, he deserved to be viewed as like the worst thing imaginable. Like that's just how some fans react. I'm not saying you're saying that. I'm saying that there are some fans that do react in that manner. Um, all I'm saying is our goal here is to winning a title 100%. We cannot do that when our prime player is going down this battle. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. And that's something that I can emphasize plenty. I want Lindor to be better. I need to see him be better. And the longer things go on where Lindor isn't performing at the rate that we want him to perform, there's going to be more criticism, and you're going to hear it more and more from me. I'm not going to hold back. I always keep it a buck. If you played like shit today, you played like shit today. Lindor played like shit today. The frustrating part is that for the vast majority of the season, literally every single day so far, he's played like shit. So that is where we have more of the discussions where, again, I understand the viewpoint. I do. It's not that I'm disagreeing with you guys and gals on that front. But before we go further in the live show, everybody, I do have to tell you about my amazing sponsor here on the channel at BetUS because right now, even though that, yes, the Mets run line is scrapped, there are still some games today that you can get in on the action on. And there's one in particular I like quite a bit. I do. And actually just started. So actually, no, it didn't just start. My bad. Or yes, it did. I'm an idiot. Let me actually go double check real quick and look at uh, live betting at the moment here. Let's see what we got for the MLB because there is one game that I've been eyeing all day. And that is, in fact, yes, the Atlanta Braves versus the Arizona Diamondbacks right now. So let me pull this up for you right now. Give me one second, folks, and we can go forward here in the show. I got a cat around me that's meowing really loud. How you doing, Goldie? Hope you're doing good. But now let's get back into this one because as you guys see here, we got the Atlanta Braves and we got the Arizona Diamondbacks. Game just started as we know. It is still 0-0 if I'm not mistaken. Right now, when looking at run line, the Atlanta Braves are plus 5.5. Oh, wait. There's no way. 
There's no way. Something happened. Is there already an early lead in this game, folks? Can someone let me know in the chat? If so, I'm actually just going to go back to the normal MLB slate then because I think there's already early production in that game, and I don't want to live bet it then. Let's see. Anybody watching the Braves game that can let me know, I really appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate the kind words, Tyler Reed. Thank you so much for that. It really does mean a lot. Um, let's see. Yeah, the Braves game. Any, any idea what's going on in that Braves game? I literally have no clue. Maybe I'll just do it myself. That's fine. Oh, D backs are up six nothing. I really hope some of you guys at least tailed my D backs run line pick today. And I just hope you didn't freaking pair it like the schmuck that I am with the Mets run line. D backs as the underdog today, run line, freaking hammer. They're up six nothing already. Are you kidding me? 6-0 in the second. They put up a six-piece on Max Freed in the first. So first, you're telling me Spencer Strider's down with injury, which, again, I don't wish. I don't wish it on anybody, but it's happening to Atlanta. Now you're telling me Max Freed is getting his titsel in the first inning? I will gladly take that. So I love that. That's great. Again, whoever tailed my Arizona Diamondbacks run line pick today, I hope you absolutely hammered big because right now you're looking great. You really are. But we got the San Diego Padres, the San Francisco Giants tonight. We got the Boston Red Sox, the LA Angels. Red Sox as the underdog? I actually love that. This is a tight pitching matchup versus a Reed Denver's that we see there for the uh, Angels. Southpaw, again, crafty. And I'm pretty sure I know who's pitching there for, yes, it's going to be Whitlock, who also has a 1.8 year rate. Great start to the season. Whitlock's been awesome. I like this. I'm loving Mr. Tyler O'Neill, Mr. Tyler Biceps. I am hammering the Red Sox today at either money line or spread. Take your pick. I'm feeling, you know, kind of confident right now. I'm actually going to go just straight money line with them. 102. So we're going to put down 50 to win 51 today. Shout out to everyone that also places their bets responsibly with BetUS. And also, again, make sure to click that link in the description. That way, you too get 125% bonus with your first three deposits at BetUS. Absolutely love that. I really like that pick today, actually. Again, for the Red Sox. They've been fun to watch so far this year. Their pitching has been better than expected. Real key matchup. Again, can they hit against the South Pond Detmers? I think they can. They got some big boppers again from the right side of the play. Tyler O'Neill is the guy that I'm looking to rake. He just had a, a couple home runs the other night. Hoping to see more of that. But again, shout out to everyone that gets involved. And thank you all so much as always. I do see a donation here. So thank you so much for that, Peter. I really do appreciate it. Peter says, baseball is a mental sport. Imagine going home and seeing our fan base sending death threats to his wife. He probably is more worried about his fam. Oh, I'm sure. And look, Lindor has been in the game long enough, so he knows how to block things out, guys. Let me put it this way. And I'm not saying I'm not saying what I'm about to say for the sake of attention or anything like that, but just to show you the scale. Since I have started YouTube, I have received many terrible comments. I received death threats my first three months into making YouTube videos. Literally, I'm not joking. Just from people watching me on YouTube. And I know that there are people that, again, will do it every week. I get some crazy things said to me on the day-by-day, week-by-week basis. But I don't let it get to me because I know, why should I? You know, why should I let a schmuck bother me when I'm absolutely loving what I'm doing? And it's being received really well from you, the viewers. So, clearly, I'm doing something right. Um, but if that stuff is happening to a content creator like me, I can only imagine the things that are said to a high-profile player on a big contract when he's not performing well. That is a commonality. Lindor faced death threats and shit like this when he wasn't hitting his first couple months into the, into the 2021 season, right? So if there are people doing this to content creators on such a small scale like myself, I am far from surprised that we have these assholes also doing the same with players themselves. And yes, it does get to them. It absolutely does. And we have this stupid ass fan base to blame for it. The fans that are to blame, the fans that are always pessimistic, the fans that go out of their way to make burners, which I know some of you watching do exactly that as you're watching me right now. You make your burners to talk shit, thinking that these players are not human, that they don't care. Even as someone who definitely tries to, you know, find a fine line with my criticism as someone who has now built relationships with current and former players. Even then, again, I can tell you, they look at everything, folks. A lot of them look at everything. They see everything. You think they don't see the stuff you say? 
on, on socials? Trust me, they do. So if you go out of your way again to say the worst things imaginable, yes, some may take it better than others. Absolutely, right? You're going to have more thick-skinned people than others. Doesn't change the fact that it will likely bother them to a degree. And that little difference, again, could impact their game. So just, just know for the schmucks out there that go the lengths of even doing the you know, death threats or just these terrible comments, know that you're directly in part the problem and you're the reason why we have to deal with this type of nonsense. So thank you for absolutely nothing, you godforsaken pieces of shit. Um, let's see, explosive. Worry people got nothing better to do than, oh, of course, of course, of course. The fun fact, I literally know, I know who one of the people is that actually sent them my way in the first couple months. And it was a fellow creator, which is a crazy thing. Just like, literally, imagine being that insecure and that butthurt that someone maybe is doing a better job than you are. It's unbelievable. It really is. Um, they're keyboard warriors, of course. I don't understand how you can call yourself a fan and have this type of attitude. I understand we suck right now, but why are you even a fan? Who are you talking to, Kevin? Are you talking about... Oh, I'm saying you're talking in general about the threats. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't, you literally have to be a sick minded individual or so immature that has been coddled your entire life that thinks you can get away with everything in order to act that way. I just don't see how otherwise you rationally make those kind of decisions because you don't. Um, see the death threat on Xbox Live once when I um, owned everyone in some BS MP. The kid may have been 10, serious business. That, that's, that's true. But again, just because that was, that's fair. We've all dealt with that on Xbox. If you haven't had someone yelling racial slurs your way and saying the worst things imaginable on Xbox growing up, you weren't living. And I'm only half joking because I feel like a lot of people, especially my generation, we went through that. Um, that doesn't change the fact. It doesn't matter the age because, again, a lot of these people hide their identities. And I tell you, I promise you, one of the people that sent Lindor the death threat to his wife in his username had the year 1968 gonna go on a limb and say the dumbass that's his birthday year right so the guy is just under 60 going out of his way to send these send these things and shame on me for assuming about the same time i can assume all i want when you go out of your way to say the things that you say so if you got it if you're gonna dish it you have to be able to take it too um let's see tony which begs a question what kind of death threats do people send to people who believe it? oh whoa tony what what whoa so that's just off topic though, Tony. That's not in, in line with this. But yes, I get I get what you're saying a little bit. I do. Um I got I got a threat from Yeah, exactly. It happened to everyone. I had them in high school too. We all do. They're always gonna happen. All these people need to love their lives because I never realized, oh yes. Especially when you let sports consume you 24-7. 100%. I let sports consume me a lot too. I just try to make sure that I never even think or I never crosses my mind to react in such a manner. But it's brutal. Robert De Niro over here. What are we talking about? Um, if you think it's easy hitting 98 miles per hour movement with fans booing you, then let those uh, that choose to boo step up to the plate. I mean, there you go, Darren's like, you know what? I'm enough of this BS. If we roasted Trevor Bauer in this chat after he shit post, I, um, let's see. Oh my God. Imagine if we roasted Trevor Bauer in this chat after he shit posts on YouTube. What are you talking about? I'm confused on that front, on the bar. I'm sorry. I'm just, something isn't clicking. And maybe it's because we're almost 50 minutes in the show. So I'm kind of losing my legs here. I'm not sure. Mad, uh, let's see here. I think the Mets fan base is one of the most ignorant. And I'm, again, a diehard Mets fan, Giants fan, Knicks fan, Rangers fan. Mets, none of the are worse than Mets fans. All New York teams have had their fair share of bad season. That's true. Uh, I will say there was one comment that really blew me away today. And it was just hilarious. If you're a Jets and a Mets fan, you have no you have no right to claim the Mets as a certain organization without looking in the mirror and knowing that the Jets are the exact same way. And we had one fan quote tweet me today regarding, you know, me just supporting what Steve Cohen was saying about Lindor and the standing O and saying, you know, how why you know, terrible player, terrible team, terrible ownership, everything, joke, everything in between. I'm like, okay. I hope you have that same energy about the other teams you're a fan of because it's literally the same. You don't just pick and choose, right? Jets fans will tell you personally that what what success have you had? None. Nada. Zero. Um, and they're in headlines all the time in dramatic fashion. You know. I mean, you're, literally your quarterback almost became a VP. That, and the fact that that's, that was even a conversation is beyond me. Um, but yeah, those kind, of, those kind of comments really cracked me up. I'm not a Jets or a Giants fan. I, I miss... 
I miss that pessimism. I'm a Steelers fan. I'm neutral with New York football teams. I don't mind either as long as they don't play the Steelers. When they do, I'm rooting against those teams, obviously. Um, but I've been a Steelers fan my whole life. So I, I, I don't got to deal with that much toxicity. The most toxic thing I have in my life is Mets fandom. 100%. As a toxic fan that I know I can be at times myself, and the toxic fans I interact with on the daily, don't get me wrong, not everyone, not everyone's toxic. A lot of you guys are awesome, and I love interacting with you. That's why we do what we do here. But yeah, I'm not a Jets or a Giants fan, like as my first team, no. Why are the Mets swinging at so many first pitches? Great question, Al Good. Great effing question. And that literally makes me want to almost go on a rant because it really pisses me off how the Mets managed to go the amount of at-bats that we saw today. Again, from your core group, there is nothing to justify having Lindor, Alonzo, first pitch swinging with guys on. Nothing to justify, especially when you're not hitting well. It's different. If Lindor's on the heater, if Lindor was already on base three times today, barely in baseballs and looking so locked in on the plate, say he's on it, you know, NL player of the week, like something along those lines, then okay, that's where it's warranted. That's where it makes sense, because it's like you know anything that he rips right now, it's going to be great contact. Not the case when you have no effing hits for the most part, and Alonzo, outside of your home run against Detroit, we got nothing. Just a couple singles, right? It's frustrating. It is very frustrating, and I'm with you, everybody. I'm with you on that front, too. I want to see change. The more we don't see change, the more I'm going to call it out. Yeah, being a Bills fan is very similar to being a Mets fan. That's true. I mean, you could argue you had it worse going back in the 90s. I don't wish losing, what, four? Was it three? Was it four Super Bowls? I'm not, not trying to give you PTSD and memories. I'm just, it's a genuine question. Like, how? How? <laughs> like, uh, word forgot about the Knicks. I haven't forgot about the Knicks. I love the Knicks. But here's the thing with the Knicks. I did not grow up watching the Knicks daily. Same way I did not grow up watching the Mets day by day. Was more of a casual viewer. Knicks, really, truthfully, when my fandom started to become stronger, was around the same time as the Mets. But since then, because of the fact that I've been far more involved with the Mets than I have the Knicks, it's been easier for me to tune out when the Knicks have not done well. And over the past two and a half years, with the runs that they've had under Tom, uh, Tom Thibodeau, Julius Randle, Jalen Brunson, and all their great supporting cast, OG Ananobi back, that is where I'm able to be like more locked in because one, they're playing well, which is great. They have an awesome core group, but two, that is what helps justify me taking time out of my day to do that when I'm already fixated and focused and working and covering the Mets literally from dusk till dawn. It's every single day. It's like that. But yes, Knicks are in that group too, for sure. And my Rangers haven't won anything in forever, but my Rangers have at least been a continued competitor. New York Rangers, for hockey fans at least, what we can say is we've had a lot of awesome runs. Regular season runs, deep playoff runs, all around similar time too. Unfortunately, they fell short to the Kings um, right before uh, the the Mets fell short to the Royals. Dear God, uh, all, the young, all the kid memories are coming back for me. I'm not a fan. Not a fan of those. Th those really, really hit the heartstrings as, as a young fan for sure. Um, let's see. Boy, I like losing Super Bowls. Okay, that's actually that's actually a funny line, Tony. You got me there. You did. Uh, but Mark, appreciate the love. Great memory here as always, everybody. But guys and gals, that is about gonna do it for the live show. I want to thank you all so much for watching. Yes, I know Randall's out for the year, and yes, it heartbreaks me. We will be back live tomorrow. Not sure if we'll have pregame out just because it's an early day game. So. Barring changes on that front, we'll soon see what happens with pregame, but we will be back live for postgame, regardless of if the Mets win or lose the series, but they absolutely need to win this series. They need to get back in the win column tomorrow. Huge, huge game to try to salvage a series, win the series in Cincy before you have a brutal stretch in Atlanta against those Braves, where Julio Tehran is going to start one of those games and probably go at least four innings if he's not kicked out out of the first. So, that's going to be it for me, everybody. Thank you all so much for chiming in. I really appreciate that. Trash talk is what Mike Jones says. It is what it is. I appreciate everyone chiming in, regardless on how you feel. We will continue the Lindor discourse. We will continue the Alonzo discourse. Look, if we don't agree and see eye to eye on everything, at least we can find common ground where, yes, I can understand where you're coming from. I don't agree with booing, but I can understand your, your psyche. For me, again, it just I'm all about trying to get the best out of your players. And if you can do something to help, do that, 
I'm in favor of it as a fan. That's me, though, at least. So thank you all so much for watching. Mets lose in a heartbreaking fashion, 9-6, to six, and they look to get back in the win column tomorrow. Till then, have a great one, folks. And as always, no matter what, let's go Mets, baby. Peace out.